Good afternoon. My name is George V. Johnson and uh, jazz vocalist, and we're here at Mr. Henry's in Capitol Hill with the one and only, my good, dear friend, beautiful, Miss Sandra Butler Truesdale. Hi, George. How are you? Hi. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about you and your history here in Washington, D.C. So first, tell us... Uh, where, where did you raise up? Where were you born? Um, first of all, George, you know I love saying I'm a fourth generation Washingtonian. Um, I came out of the 1400 block of Parkland Street Northwest, uh, where my aunt, my great great aunt, Emma Dove, purchased two houses in 1810, if you can imagine a black woman buying a house at any time in Washington, D.C. But she purchased 1458 and 1460. Parkland Street Northwest wow. in 1810. We have the deed to prove so. Um, so that is where, when I left Freedman's Hospital, the Black Hospital, uh, <laughs> on Bryant Street. I lived um, on the corner of Oakdale. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I just said to you, I'm a Black woman that was born in a Black hospital that went back home to a Black neighborhood. And so that's where I went uh, when I, you know, after I was born. To 1458 Parkland Street. Um, and so that's where I originated from. And then as a black child in a black neighborhood, I went to a black school called Garrison Elementary School, which was located at um, 12th and R Street, Northwest Washington, DC. And then on to Shaw Junior High School and to Cardoza Senior High School. So that's my early, early existence uh, in Washington, D.C. And from Cardoza Senior High School, I went to Howard University and um, where my father graduated from as well. So I am really born and bred in Washington, D.C. So tell us tell us what, what it was like growing up by you and your siblings. And what it was like going to, to junior high school and high school in Washington, D.C.? Well, you know, fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, I'm an only child. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and I was raised in my grandmother's home at 1458. Uh, though at that time, people sort of lived in family homes. Uh, we had a large family. My grandmother had seven children. She had four uh, girls and three boys, and we all lived in that seven-bedroom home. Uh, you know, all of us. And so we just had a lovely family. My grandfather was there. Uh, I'm the granddaughter of an ice man. And you all don't ice know man. about yeah, ice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my grandfather had an ice truck and an ice house. Where? At, on 15th Street at 15th and Church Street. And so he, after he sold the ice house, he sold ice on the corner of 15th and Corcoran. And so he supplied all the people in that neighborhood with ice. I remember having him having ice tongues. And ice tongues, you know, that's when you could pick up uh, 25 pounds of ice that he delivered to people in the neighborhood. But he would go to Uline Arena, where the ice house is, with his truck, pick up 100 pounds of ice, put it on his truck, you know, several of these 100 pounds of ice, pick them up, and he would bring them back. Uh, and then he used what they call an ice pick. And he would divide these ice, this ice up into 25 pound ices. And he took them to people. Guess what? So tell them, so tell them where did they put the ice at? Sometimes they put it in the ice box. No, in your, yeah, in your house, you had an ice box. Sometimes, yeah. but some people couldn't afford an ice house, an ice box. So what they did was to put the ice in a tin tub. And they would put this ice in a tin tub and they put their food in this tin tub to keep it fresh. And those who couldn't afford a tin tub put this ice on the windowsill. And they would put their food on the windowsill where this ice was to keep it cold. Because people, we were the only ones, I think, on our block beside the Willises that owned our own home. So they lived in what they call tenement houses. And so that was where people lived. Maybe there were families, one, two, three, the third floor, the first floor, and the, you know, the second floor. And so they had shared bathrooms and shared kitchens. And so they, this is the way that people lived and survived as they came up from the South. Tell us about the telephones. 
<laughs> the telephones they had, uh, everybody who happened to have a phone, uh, they had shared lines. And so there may be three or four people on one line. Two, two, and two what was really lines. so <laughs> funny, they call them party lines. Yeah. And so when you picked up the phone, the phone would ring and everybody had a separate ring. So sometimes the phone would ring <laughs> and you could hear everybody's ring. So you could pick up the phone and hear somebody's conversation. You understand? You say, hello? Hello? Say, Who is this? Who is this? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so sometimes people would hear and they would know somebody was on the line hearing their conversation. Um, and if you were courteous enough, you know, you would have sense enough to hang up and let somebody have a private conversation. And then later on, somewhere, I can't tell you what year it was, you begin to have private lines. And you got the area code. Because we didn't have an area code. Yeah. Oh, well, our, our telephone number was Hobart 27150. You know, and then after a while it became four six two seven five. I was Decatur, and then after a while it became two o two. You know, yeah. and we kept that. You know, we kept that telephone number for almost maybe sixty years. We had that same telephone number. That was really interesting uh, that it went all that long time. Funny thing, I still remember John Malachi's telephone number three nine six four two six three. I always remember his number. So, Sandra. Uh, what was it like? Tell us about your experience with uh, with racial discrimination and going to high school and different things like that. In well, DC. you know, my mom was a really smart woman. She was one of the first black women to work in the federal government that was not a domestic. And what it was a what is a domestic is a person who cleans, uh, you know, the desk and cleans up the government. So she was a clerk, and so she. At that time, black people worked in the basement. You know, they, they didn't work on the up, upper floors. And so she was one of the first black women that worked in the federal government that was not a domestic. And so the experience was excruciating for her because they were grade one and two. Uh, and I think she ended up, with, by the time she retired, some 40 years later, she finally was maybe a grade four or maybe a grade yeah. six, mm -hmm. and they finally moved them upstairs. But the black men who worked in the government were able to move upstairs because they were what they call messengers. And what right. were messengers? They delivered the mail to the other offices, so they had the opportunity to go upstairs and <laughs> be amongst the kings and queens of whiteism. <laughs> And so, I mean, it's just so interesting how um, this is set up so that it is um, systematic racism. Our young people have no idea what we went through. Um, and fortunately, uh, my father and mother um, did a lot as to move us forward as integration is concerned because they were way before a Dr. Martin Luther King uh, and a Malcolm X. They, while I'm not so sure that was the right thing to do, as I look back on it, uh, they were the ones who, along with Wilhelmina Jackson Rowlock and John Yeldell, that sparked integration in Washington, D.C. Because did you know that we could not eat downtown? Yes. Did you know that we could not shop downtown? I just remember us being able to go to Boyce and Lewis and buy a decent pair of shoes? Did you know we couldn't go to Garfinkel's? Did you know the only store that we could shop in was a store called Cans, where yeah. they didn't discriminate against Cans us? We companies. couldn't <laughs> try on clothes. Yeah. We couldn't try on shoes. We couldn't try. They didn't want black women to try hats on because they said we had grease in our hair and it would, you know, stain the hats. So we couldn't try that on. What we could do is we could take the hat home and put something in the hat so, <laughs> so the brim of the hat wouldn't get greasy and maybe we could bring it back. So these are the kinds of things that we, our children don't know because it's too painful to tell them. And, and, and so they don't know that we have gone through these things. I was saying to us a little earlier, living in Petworth, Washington, D.C., when my mother bought a home, she paid $14,500 for at 801 Barnum Street, Northwest, where we lived 52 years. Before the integration of the public schools, I walked from 8th and Barnum to 13th and Clifton to go to Cardoza Senior High School Why? because it was segregated. 
And when they integrated the schools, they opened it up and said, you, we could go to Roosevelt. And oh, excuse me, I do know that I'm a minister. But I said, hell no. I've been walking past Roosevelt all these, you know, this time. So I'm gonna keep walking. So I kept going to Cardoza. And the thing that was greatest success for me was after all of that, and I had graduated from Howard University, I decided to run for the Board of Education in Ward 4 because that's where I lived. I ran and won, and I was in charge of, guess what, all the schools <laughs> in Ward 4, including Roosevelt, the one that I had to walk past because I was Black, obviously Black, not paper bag brown, obviously Black. <laughs> and I was in charge of the same school that they wouldn't let me attend. I'm just saying that to you because I want, I want people to know that I was not angry. I was getting even. And that's what's important. And not just getting even, but I wanted the children to be able to take advantage of certain opportunities that I did not have. And that's what it's all about. Okay, now, so we're going to go to the music part of your life. Tell us uh, uh, how did music affect you and how did you get involved with music? Well, you know, George, music was always a great part of our life as Black people. Mm -hmm. Almost all Black people had a piano in their home. <laughs> we had a piano in our home at, on Coughlin Street. And not only did we have a piano, my grandmother had an organ and a piano in our home. And she could play the organ and the piano. Not just that, my grandfather could play the harmonica. And he called it a, a, a mouth organ. So oh, he God. played that and he tried to teach us how to play. And all I knew how to do was, you know, the sound that I made was really, just really <laughs> ridiculous. And they, there was a guy down the street, his name was Professor Miller. And Professor Miller was a piano teacher. And he tried to, bless his heart, he tried to teach us how to play the piano. And then as I went to high school, Professor Miller pushed us into music at Cardoza. And guess who was in my class at Cardoza Senior High School? Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye. <laughs> and so we were in the choir together. And we, I could never sing, but I acted like I did. And I would always sit beside somebody who could sing. And they, so they thought I could sing too. Um, but Marvin was in our class and Professor Finley, who was the music teacher at Cardoza, taught us music. But saying that music was in the neighborhoods, you could go out of your door and there was always music on the corner. Did you know that they used to take a big tin can, put a rope in it and put it and tie it to a broomstick and play it and it sounded just like a bass hook? a place and they would also they would do that and they would have somebody would have a horn and they would have another kind of instrument and you could go down on the corner of 14th and Coughlin Street and somebody they would be playing music. I lived down see 14th and T where the spa was. Oh, yeah. I could walk down to 14th and T and there was music there. I lived maybe six to ten blocks from the Howard Theater. And so I learned to appreciate the Count Basies and the Duke Ellingtons. Guess what? Duke Ellington lived around the corner from me on R Street. Mm -hmm. So all this music was around. My mother bought. A, was that thirteenth and R? Thirteenth and R. Mm -hmm. My mother bought a baby grand piano. Bless her heart, she wanted me to play so bad, um, but she bought it and put it in our reception hall, and uh, so I could play it a little bit, but you know, not a. And I can read. Oh, okay, so what made, so you were going to places like the Howard Theater, and it was a couple other spots on U Street. Tell yeah. us about U Street. Uh, well, don't forget now, some of this happened way before me. I just rem I remember my aunts telling me about the ballet, Club Ballet. Now, the yeah, Club mm -hmm. Ballet yeah, Club Ballet. I remember uh, that. and the spa is the same place. Uh, and I know that my aunt was a great dancer. She loved to dance, so she used to go to the Club Ballet. And the Club Ballet was where Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, and all these people performed. That was at 14th and T, uh -huh. which later became the spa. And uh, other clubs were right, you know, next door to there. 
And as you go around the corner, don't forget the Lincoln Theater was the Lincoln Colonnade, which was down yeah. in the basement. And so once again, all these great performers and the Republic Gardens, don't forget about that. Ella Fitzgerald was discovered in the Republic Gardens. So all of this was going on on U Street. And I was just a little girl, like five years old or so, but I can remember my relatives talking about all of this and the great things that were happening on U Street. And people, you were there to see people walk on U Street that look like they look now. Because when people went to U Street, they were dressed up. Men had on suits and hats and women. You see that I put this rose in my hair, particularly for this, because women had roses in their hair. They had on gloves and pocketbooks, you know, and they classic. looked like somebody. Yeah. I don't know who they look like now, but they, I mean, it was a great thing to walk to U Street. And men were just fabulous, you know, because y'all know I love men. Okay, there you go. <laughs> but um, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing to go in these clubs. Actually, at my age, I was not able to go in the clubs. You know what I'm saying? But I used to love to go and just look and watch because I wanted to. You see, I wear a lot of jewelry. And I wear it because this is what women did. My aunt had a full length ranch mink coat. And I used to always say, when I grow up, I'm gonna get me a ranch mink coat and I'm gonna have jewelry on all my fingers, just like her, cause she looks so classy, you know? And that's what we thought rich people did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you see, I do the same thing now. Yeah. I got diamonds in my ears and I got diamonds on my fingers. And it makes me think, I'm not rich, but hey, you know, it makes me think. Always elegant. Hello. And, but um, this is what makes me feel like I'm back in time, I think. But when you go a little bit further down, you see that there is the Howard Theater. Right. And you think about Cecilia's and then the reason that I met the entertainers that I really met was because I was in the School of Cosmetology. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you next. How did you get involved with music and with musicians? And yeah, tell us about that. Well, uh, Poro Beauty School was like three doors down from the Howard Theater. And that is, the Howard Theater is actually on T Street. Yes. And there's a little street in between there called Wiltberger Street. Um, and Wiltberger Street divides um, the Howard Theater from Cecilia's Restaurant. Right. Cecilia's Restaurant and Bar was a place where all the entertainers, Lou Rawls, I can't even name all the fantastic Bill Withers, anybody that you can think of went into Cecilia's. That was a restaurant? The restaurant and the bar. And also Cecilia's had a hotel up above there. Mm -hmm. And and of course the street, um, there was a, a lady who had places where the Temptations, the Supremes, all of them stayed in her house. She had two houses across the street. And then she had houses around the corner as well. And so... This rest, this um, school was, like I said, was two doors down. Right. But guess what? The entertainers that came, if they made $100 a week, they were doing good. They didn't make much money. So they came to the school to get facials, to get their nails done, and to get their hair done. And it was only a dollar. Who were some of the people that you did? Diana yeah. Ross. Uh, a lot of the Supremes. Um, that, uh, the young lady, her last name was Reeves. Um, I did Martha Reeves, Martha Reeves, Martha Reeves and the Van Dallas, yeah. that whole group. Uh -huh. And all of those ladies that came, you know, later on that were around my age, I did their hair. Did you do processes too? I that? did processes, but I didn't do, I didn't like doing processes. Um, Square John, that was in the barbershop down at 7th and T, did most of the processing. Uh, he did He did James Brown's hair. The way I got hooked up with James was because James wanted somebody to travel on the road with him. And Square John had so much of a trade, he didn't want to travel. So he recommended me to James. And I had to go home and ask my mother if I could travel with James. And so she said yes. And I went and I traveled with James to do his hair 
for two years and I introduced the jewels to James Brown. Wow. And that's how they got connected with James Brown because Martha High lived down the street from me. She saw James Brown's bus in, parked in front of my door all the time. Were they from DC? They were from DC. Uh -huh. And so she then came and knocked on my door, bless her heart, and said, is James in here? I said, no. She said, well, I want to meet him. I, James was playing at Masonic Temple. I said, well, if you meet me at Masonic Temple, I will take you and I will introduce you. I introduced her to James Brown, and that's how they got connected with him. Mm -hmm. And so we all went on the road with James. I stayed with him two years, and that was long enough for me because James was a different kind of person. So, so tell 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 us about some of your other experiences uh, uh, with, with with musicians, and then and then uh, I know you have a love for musicians and love for the music. Tell us how you got involved with helping musicians. You, you have your organization. How you help musicians? You do so much for the community. You know, after I began to work with Ray Charles, because Ray was a real nice guy, though. <laughs> He was funny. <laughs> I, I just remember that uh, he was an interesting guy. Mm -hmm. I remember James uh, being so different from Ray. And Ray, even Ray was blind. But Ray, was, he would fly his plane. He just did all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff. Uh, but he, um, he loved women. That's what I like about him. <laughs> he loved women. But one of the things that I, I want to make clear is that I was born and raised in a church that was a holiness church. And I was taught morals and values. Mm -hmm. And I learned not to get involved emotionally and any other way with men that I wasn't interested in. Mm -hmm. So I did not get involved with them sexually. or It, it was a business with me. Mm -hmm. And so once I established that with them, they didn't push it. They, they, one thing I learned about men is they don't go no further than you really let them go. And so I, I, I kept it on a business Demand basis. And respect, yeah. yeah. And so I met Calvin Jones. I met Fathead Newman. And we would just have a big time, you know, and I would laugh and go home. And they would say all kinds of things. Baby, I love you. Yes, you. that's right. I love you, too. I'll see you later. Uh, so all that kind of stuff happened. But I kept myself at a level. Uh, no, we're not doing that. Bye. See you. Uh, <laughs> and then they went on to the next, you know, because they weren't really interested in, not really, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> see tomorrow. But uh, <laughs> they, um, and I, I did the Ray Let's Hair. And so that was very interesting. Those ladies um, were an interesting group. But afterwards, I realized that they needed service. Because what, what happened is I found out that musicians love music. They love what they're doing. They're not interested in their needs. Mm -hmm. They just want to play their horn, uh, you know, play the keyboard, whatever it is that they're playing. But they don't think about benefits. And I found that out as I worked with them. And so when I came home, I decided to put together this organization that gives that does research and finds how to give them the kinds of benefits they need. They don't think about paying into social security. They don't think about, oh, I'm gonna get old one day and I might not be able to blow this home. And so having done that, I was able to hook into the Office on Aging, uh, Georgetown University, and be able to get benefits for musicians. So when they need, all I have to do is plug into one of my resources and get them what they need for hospitalization or whatever else it is that they need. And it doesn't cost them a dime. And you do this through the, uh, the DC Legendary Musicians. Can you tell us about how you started that the group and some of the things that, that you've been doing around for over the years, how long? Uh, I opened up to the DC Legendary Musicians. Actually, DC Legendary Musicians was a part of my ministry. Oh, okay. Because as I said, while it may not seem like it, I I might hear me minister for real. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, but um, I started it in 2002. It came out of it grew out of the ministries of the Reverend Sandra Butler Truesdale, mm -hmm. and uh, it became the DC Legendary Musicians Incorporated. It's a 501c3, 
one of the things that has never happened, I've never been able to be funded completely. So, but it doesn't hurt me because I've been able to provide the service I need to service the musicians without being funded. Um, but I've been in, it's, we've been in existence since 2002. And the mission is, as I said, to provide the kinds of services and benefits for Washington DC's musicians. And even at that, we expand to musicians of the DMV because guess why? Musicians born in Washington DC often can't live here. Guess why they can't live here? Because they can't afford to. It's the cost of living is too high. So now we're in the process, we're working with um, Herb Scott and some of the other organizations trying real hard to get housing here uh, for DC musicians. Not affordable housing, because that doesn't work. We're talking about low income housing so that musicians can live where they work. But anyway, we, we're working real hard to do that. And I'm praying every day that we will be able to pull these organizations together so that we can do that. One of the things that I admire that you do every year, uh, you, you feed musicians you know, around uh, Thanksgiving and different holidays. Uh, you go out and you raise money. Can you tell us uh, about that? Yeah. We've been blessed to be able to get at least two to 300 turkeys every year. And then in doing that, and the turkeys are free. Uh, we, be, we are able to get that done. And then we, do, <laughs> then we beg. And we get, um, you know, the fixings that go along with it. We go through Safeway. And again, we work with uh, Herb and Aaron. And we, uh, some of the musicians will bring us uh, some of the fixings, uh, Westminster Church. Um, we work through Metropolitan AME. Uh, they will give us some canned goods and all the stuff that we need for the fixings. We do the baskets or the boxes or whatever. We get a list from the musicians who needs and, you know, and all that. We fix it and we invite them. Last year, we were able to do it on the Westminster's property. Um, and not only did we feed all the musicians that needed it, we fed people in the community. People were driving by in trucks. We don't know who they were. Yeah, no. After we fed all the musicians, we just took the boxes and gave it to whoever came by. It, oh, it's about helping people, George. I don't care who they are. Well, you know, this year, last year, I got a box. I was real sick. I didn't say anything to nobody. I was real sick. And when I got that box, man, it like made my day because I couldn't even get out, get no groceries or anything. When I got that box and that turkey and stuff was in there, it was so good. It was so good. That really meant a lot to me because I never got a handout for anybody. But it's not a handout. It, stop. It's not a handout. No. It's a hand up. Yeah. No, we're not handing out. It's a hand up. It, That's what's important. But it made my it made my week. It made. I just wanted to tell you that I really appreciate it. Well, that. I'm, I'm thankful. God is in the blessing business. I don't care how I act, and, and you know, as I always tell y'all, I, I love men. Yeah, I do because I'm a woman. I love men. But uh, <laughs> um, you know, I am. Um, I'm thankful that God blessed me to be able to do it. And I'm at 81 years old, I'm asking God to continue to bless me to keep being able to move on this journey like this, okay? So tell me, uh, uh, what would you have to say to, uh, to the musicians, to the public? Uh, what would be one of the most important things that, of advice that you'd have to offer? to people, the public, and just to musicians, to the city, and everything. I would say that we need to make sure that we are working together for the good of each other, because there's nothing that we can accomplish if we are not working together. And the other part of that is no matter what has happened, to be, to hate, or to be disturbed by what has happened in the past, let it go. Is, you gotta let it go. I'm telling you, if if we keep care, if we keep carrying it, it doesn't help anything. It is about after you identify the problem, it's about a solution. That's what I'm talking about. I don't care about. I'm not gonna say I don't care about it because yeah, it does. Sometimes it bothers me. But look, if I don't have a solution to it, it don't mean a damn thing. I need a solution to the problem. That's all. And then after you can find a solution to it, then what are the next steps to make it happen? That's what it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any last words? Anything you'd like to? 
Right. It's somebody bigger than you and I. That's it. And if possible, uh, direct that back to that conversation between you two. The answer to it. So, what do you think about the what do you think about the music today, and where it's going? And uh, just tell us your, your what thoughts. I what I think about it is it it reflects what's going on with with our young people. I think that when we came along, when I came along, at least. It was the same kind of feeling, R&B, the way that it came about, you know, the doo-wop, and uh, they used to laugh at us, the people who really loved jazz. Yes. Uh, they hated the doo-wop. Uh, my mother and them used to hate to hear the Spaniels and the Dells and, you know, that woo-wop and stuff that we were listening to. They felt the same way, I think, about that as I may think about Go-Go. And so... All I think is that we need to embrace it and embrace the young people. We might need to work with them to try to clean it up some, but they are doing or relating what they see and what they hear and what is happening to them. And the only thing I know that we can do is to just embrace it, embrace it and clean it up. Because with the music that I, we were listening to, I'm not sure... I, I think about Miles Davis sometimes, and people got mad with Miles because he went into a whole nother vein and decided to do some R&B stuff, you know, and he put on the fringes and whatnot, and they were mad with him because they said that he, you know, went into another vein, but it cleaned it up some. And so I think that that's what we also need to do um, to help our babies out. Look at that. They're looking at me like, what did she just say? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it's all right. They're going to be okay. They're going to be okay. They, we just got to teach them how to fight. That's all. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw one second. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you got something? No, no. Um, I should have thought of this before, but the one question I, I like to get, I guess, everybody to answer so we'll right now. Um, this project will be archived at the library. I wonder what role the library, the recent public library, has played in your life and work. Yeah, especially oh, God, yeah. to listen to music. I guess the question in part is, where did you listen to music? Was it on the radio, in record stores? Uh, <laughs> uh, That's a good question. And again, uh, 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 correct me, George. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because you know why? Um, Waxy Maxi. Waxy Maxi was on 7th Street, across the street from what was Key's Restaurant. And actually, it was at 7th and T Streets Northwest. I really listened to Cliff Holland on WOOK. And after I listened to D Cliff Holland, I would run down to Waxy Waxy's to pick the, out, the record up or whatever it was. And Waxy Waxy was so cool, they had a listening booth. You know, you could go in there and, and ask for the record. And the man that owned Waxy Waxy, he worked in the store for real. And you could go in there, you know, and, and I just thought I was so cool. You know, I mean, really. Uh, with my sunglasses on, and I would ask for the record, you know, and we could go in a little booth and listen to it. And um, I would, you know, buy it and then go across the street to uh, Keys and sit down and eat, and oh boy, was I cool. But the answer to the question is really, I started out listening to Cliff Holland on WOOK, well, and and that music was just, wow. Yeah, because in them days, it was AM. AM. We, we had WOOK, and we had we had W-O-L came out then. W-O-L. So did you forgot about the Soul Shack. Yeah, but the Soul Shack <laughs> didn't exist when Waxy Maxi. Because, and the other part of that is Waxy Maxi was right in the same vicinity as the Howard Theater. Right. So don't forget, you could go to the right, Howard right. Theater, listen, to, go to the show, and you could stay at the show all day. You could go into the show 1 o'clock at the Howard Theater. And you could stay there until 10 o'clock, the last show. Then you could run to Waxy Maxi and get the, you know, all, whoever was up here, you could get all their music and then go sit down and eat. So, okay. what, so what are the 45s and the albums cost then? 90 that? cents? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes 75 cents, it depends. Because don't forget you had the 45s that had the little big old hole in it. 
and it had a little adapter in there that you, you know, so you could make sure that you could play it. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, and guess what? I still got them. <laughs> uh, so, so back in the, uh, in the 60s, when the Black Panthers and Andrew Davis and George Jackson, H. Brad Brown, all that was happening, what were you, what was going, what were you doing in, in the 60s? Being a rebel. Being a rebel. <laughs> I had a big old bush like I had. <coughs> like, I think we uh, all had a big bush. Yeah, huh? I had almost. It was bigger than the one I have now. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I was a rebel with a cause. Yeah, well, Sandra, I really enjoyed this conversation today. Thank it's you. always a pleasure to talk to you. We get together pretty <laughs> often sometimes, and she's one of my favorite people in Washington, D.C. Thank I you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I do. I really do. Yeah. It means my work is not in vain. Thank you so much.